All right, brother. So uh, we're going to get started today. It's yes, January 24th. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not for us. It's actually Sunday, January 27th. We're on the South Side office here at the Parsonage, and brother and I are recording today's message that you're watching today, today for us. So thank you, brother, for being willing to, to come over and oh, sure to get this done. You. Uh, I think everybody appreciates being able to still have a lesson and everything. So uh, how about we begin with a word of prayer? We don't have to wait for anybody to gather in because we're just going to get started and then... Yeah. And then we'll jump into the conversation, shall we? Thank you, Pastor. So, Lord, thank you for your loving kindness and for the ways, Lord, that you provide for us and care for us. And we seek your blessing as we study your word together. Uh, we seek, God, your understanding as we seek your Holy Spirit's guidance as well. Uh, thank you for Brother Robert, for the words and the spirit of wisdom and humility that you have given to him. And may you bless us now with an understanding of your word. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Thanks be to God. Take it away, brother. Pastor, thank you. And good morning, seekers. It's an exciting morning today, as Pastor has described. And today we're studying the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. And our lesson is entitled, Nothing Can Separate Us from God's Love in Christ. Amen. And we're talking about nothing. So the book of Romans is a New Testament book written about 57 AD. It's thought to have been written by the Apostle Paul. And the purpose of the book was to introduce Paul to the Romans and to give a sample of his message before he arrives in Rome. And, and Pastor, that was a pretty long story about him getting in prison before he arrived in Rome and he had a lot of hard times there. Yeah, I think he makes the men uh, mention that you know, he's long to go there, he's wanting to, he's been trying to, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so. That, that's for another story, but that's yeah. really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and definitely. Our scripture said, in, so Paul had finished his work in the East, and he planned to visit Rome. And the Roman church was mostly Jewish. It also contained a great number of Gentiles. So some of our definitions that we can go over, and the first one is, what is God's love? When you think in terms of, and we talk about God loving us. So love can be expressed as wanting the best for someone. And that's exactly what God intends for us. So God loves you simply because he loves you. Amen. You do not have to work for his affection. God did not force himself on anyone. And those who come to him do so in response to his love. And then we think in terms of what is Jesus' love. So he showed kindness to all. Jesus went about doing good to everyone without any kind of partiality. Jesus did not covet what others had, living a humble life without complaining. And Pastor, that's an important characteristic, living a life and be satisfied with what you have with the resources that the Lord has given you. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're not satisfied, it's easy to complain. And so maybe that's a, maybe that's a, a sign that if we're caught up so much in complaining, maybe you know, there, there's a... a sense of satisfaction that we're missing something that we don't have that we're hoping to have that we have yet to to hold on to so yeah um seem the more satisfied you are the less complaining you do i think yeah, and the more time you have to focus on the lord sure yeah. yeah so jesus did not brag about who he was in the flesh although he could have overpowered anyone that he had ever came in contact with so god did not demand obedience from his son either but rather Jesus willingly obeyed his Father in heaven. So Jesus was and is always looking out for the interest of others. And that's Jesus' love when we think about what that is. Next, we talk about how and what is it to love God when, in terms of when we love God. We say we love God, but what does that mean? So one way to define that is loving God requires knowing him and that knowledge begins with his word. That means to read his word, spend time in his word, yeah. and, and develop the relationship using the word and prayer. To love God is to worship and praise him. To love God is to put him first. And the number one commandment is to love God. Everybody remembers that. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's from Mark 12, verse 20, uh, 30. So if we love God with all our hearts, our soul, our mind, and strength, 
then we won't allow other things to crowd in. To love God is to obey Him. And then Jesus tells us, If you love me, you will obey what I command. However, this is not a matter of merely following rules and registering good deeds on your, on your record. It is about having God's love written indelibly on our hearts. So we naturally wish to please those that we love. But when we love God, we want to please Him and obey His commands eagerly. And one of the passages is, I delight to do your will. And that's from Psalms 48. Yeah. So Pastor, how do we love God? Pastor, how is the best way we can approach that in our lives? So uh, your line there is, we naturally wish to please those we love. Um, and I, I use the, it's easy for me to think of you know, the illustration of marriage, you know, when a, a couple stands there before God and before the congregation, and they're making these vows to each other. And these aren't rules, right, necessarily. They're, they're vows of commitment to one another. And sometimes people say, well, you know, in Scripture it talks about, you know, you can mess up and God will forgive you. And so why not just go and do whatever you want and ask God for forgiveness, you know, afterwards? Well, because that hurts God, <laughs> all right? And same way that, you know, a spouse wouldn't go out and do stuff uh, against their spouse, you know, um, because they love them. The same is true for us and God. I mean, why would we want to go out and um, intentionally do things to dishonor God, to, to forget our calling, to neglect his love for us? Why would we want to do those things if we love God? And so um, in order to love God, like you said, we, we put him first. We, we understand that he is our top priority because of who he is. Right. And then we find ways to to live out that uh, that first priority uh, in, in who we are and, wh and what we do with our life. And, and Pastor, and then we need to work on that every day on our relationship with the Lord. Sure. And, and through prayer and reading the Bible. And, and we've talked about this before. And, and keeping in contact with, with other Christians and helping each other. Yeah. And then we talked about faith and, and love and, and, you know, and those characteristics. Those, those spouses, they got married. They don't just come back, you know, a year later and say, hey, still love you. Glad we did this. No, it's it's a it's a daily life with each other, right? And you're growing in love with one another and um, you're finding ways to express that love and to, you're learning more about each other as well. That's a part of the, um, the joy of this love. It's the same thing that happens with God as well. We're learning more about God as we, as we grow in love, love with the Lord. So. Well, thank you, Pastor. Sure. Pastor, and the next phrase here, the next term, terminology is in Christ. How does, in, and what does in Christ mean? So lots of times we hear that, we hear people say, you know, I am in Christ. What does that mean? So one way to define that is the phrase in Christ or in Christ Jesus refers to the state of the believer. It may be helpful to read instead of in Christ because of Christ. Hmm. So if you have asked God to forgive your sins and have declared your decision to follow Jesus with your life, then you are saved in Christ. And, and, and Pastor, that's a pastoral type of a, a phrase, in Christ. So when when you hear that, what comes to mind? Or when you're saying that, what comes to mind? In Christ. So a couple things come to mind for me. You know, if you've ever heard someone say, man, she was in the zone, right? <laughs> or he was in character. And what that means is if you're in the zone, then, you know, there's, there's just, I don't know, there's something guiding you and, you make you're making every shot and you're just kind of in this rhythm of, of what you're doing your sport for example basketball or whatever it may be or if you're in character then you know you're you're you've assumed the identity of, of whatever character that you're in right and so if we sort of take that within Christ in sort of a superficial level it's you know we've taken on our identity in Christ so we put put that on us and so to be in Christ is to be uh, in communion with with Jesus, uh, to be togetherness with him uh, so that his life becomes our life. Right? Not that we become Jesus or we become Christ or God, but we become um, we, we have this the communion, this unity with Jesus that we can't have if we're not in Christ. Um, so, yes, yeah, sports metaphors. First thing that comes to my mind. 
<laughs> because I like that phrase where it's because of Christ. Sure. He substituted because of Christ is because of Christ has faith and and, and saved. Yeah, I mean, because that that honors what Christ, what we know Christ has done. It honors what what we believe or who we believe and what I guess who Christ is, and uh, puts that power back and leaves it solely on Jesus. Right? It doesn't put the power or the recognition on us. It's that we are in his identity and, and in who he is. Um, Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. So the purpose of our lesson today is to celebrate that since God's love has yielded all that has been done in Christ, and in, in Christ, there is no power that can shake that love. So that's a powerful statement. Pastor, no power can shake that love that we have, or the love that God has, that Jesus Christ has for us. Amen. So some background information. Today's scripture demonstrates how Paul wrote the book of Romans as an organized and, and carefully presented statement of his faith. So Paul writes about the love of God and how down to the last second of life, the Christian is held secure in his sovereign hands, in the Lord's hands. Only those who are truly Christ will be held until the end, for they have true faith in him. Time of doubt, times of doubt may come, and the storms of light, life may assail them and us. But if we belong to Christ, we are held by him, and we belong to him always. Amen. So such biblical truth should cause Christians to draw near humbly to the throne of God, know and grow in the love of God. So these verses contain one of the most comforting promises in all the scripture. It is impossible to be separated from Christ's presence. So Pastor, that's a, again, that's another powerful statement. We have a lot of powerful statements today I mean, in our lesson. Well, and you talked about Romans being a, what is it, organized and carefully presented statement of his faith. And that's it is whether it's meant to be a you know a true statement of faith or not um, you know that's up for debate but it certainly is out of the letters that we have the works that is most organized and that presents the most uh, ongoing thought um, not really some people may call it sort of system uh, systematic theology that there is this you know total idea and picture that he's trying to um, draw us into and whether again whether that's true or not we don't know but it certainly lends itself to being uh, the most complete um, thought of, of his theology and what he thought about God and the relationship between us and God and, and Jesus and what all that means and how it works so. and, because again, and that the Lord will never give up on us sure yeah. there, and there's even thought in the book of Romans of course I don't, I don't read biblical Hebrew but from what I've read time and time again uh, it's actually a uh, somewhat difficult no even in English it's a difficult book to read sometimes it's like you read a sentence and you think well, what is that wait a minute I got to re read that and you know but apparently in, in Greek it's the same way it's just you know some of it reads so long it's you know you got to kind of follow it very closely to, to, to keep the train of thought that he had but again because he's trying to sort of unpack some of this um, some of these ideas he has about uh, about the love of God, about uh, our standing with God, and, and what that means for the, the Christian. So. so thank you, Pastor. So we'll move on to our scripture text today, and here we're reading Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. For nothing can separate us from God's love. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is with us, who can be against us? Amen. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up, for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at the God's right hand pleading for us. So Paul says that Jesus is pleading for us in heaven as an advocate. God has acquitted us and has removed our sin and guilt. So it is Satan, not God, who accuses us. 
So no matter what happens to us, no matter where we are, we can never be separated from God's love. Suffering should not drive us away from God, but help us to identify with Him and allow His love to heal us. So Paul says that Christ died, was raised, is now on God's right side, and pleads our case for us. So, Pastor, nothing can separate us from God's love. Pastor, do you have any thoughts about that statement? You know, just and we, we think so much about Jesus you know, walking the earth and you know, showing us, telling us about the love of God. And we say, oh, Jesus loves us. Um, and I just think sometimes we, we, we think about you know, the words that he spoke, the stories that he told, which, you know, obviously for obvious reason. But what Paul is getting us to, to recognize is where Christ is now, right, at the right hand of God, which is the position of power and authority um, given by God. Where Christ is now, Christ is still um, demonstrating that love to us. You know, calling him an advocate, right? And I, and I don't, you know, I don't know how we picture that. I don't think it's Jesus turning to God and saying, "All right, let's, let's just give Robert and John one more chance, please, God." It's not like that. It's I don't I don't know what it's like, but I doubt it's like that. But the fact that Paul recognizes that. Christ being where he is even today is still um, still living out his love for us. It's pretty, that is pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and, and Pastor, when we think in terms of individual us, we think all the people that are living and all the people that had lived in the past, yeah. and he's thinking of us as individuals. That's, we can't even com comprehend that. Mm -mm. So, mm -mm. It's amazing. Amen. Pastor, thank you. So we'll move on to Verses 35 through 39 in Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Am I, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Amen. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, Pastor, that's, a, again, another powerful set of uh, verses and statements. So, Paul provides a personal testimony by saying that I am convinced. So Pastor, mm -hmm. then that, that begs the question, are we convinced? Yeah. I, uh, I, remember doing a sermon many years ago about the difference between um, being oh how did I put it but it was being convinced and being convicted right convicted and you know Paul shares both of those he's convinced uh, of this of this love of God, which is, you know, we think about it, if we say this is his most organized thought and this is where he's laying out, uh, for whatever reason, the, you know, the most important parts of his theology, he's, he's telling us in that work that uh, the most important thing is nothing can separate you from the love of God. So that tells us, you know, when Jesus says that, you know, first commandment is to love God, that, that's still right. That hasn't gone, that hasn't changed at all um, because uh, the greatest thing about our faith in God is that God has loved us, right? And there's nothing that we can do about it, right? Uh, there's nothing that we can do to change God's uh, mind. But being convinced of that um, leads Paul to all these other understandings. Right? Every, everything stems from that, that idea he has about the love of God. And so that's why we talk about the love of God so much. Right? Yeah. People, I've, I've been asked before, why I don't talk about the devil more or talk about evil more and 
my response is the same now. It's like, I don't need to talk to you about those. Things. You see those things everywhere, right? You can turn on the news and see evil, right? You can put anything on TV. You can, you can find evil. Uh, what we need to be reminded of, I'm convinced, is what Paul is talking about, that this love of God is so powerful and it, and it, and it works in so many ways that we're not um, sort of naturally tuned to, that we need to talk about it so much that it starts becoming that first nature to us, that it starts replacing um, our images of uh, superficial love or uh, where we lack in, in understanding faith and grace. That's why we talk about it so much. And Pastor, I think sometimes also that maybe we forget about the love of God, that He loves us so much, especially when we have times of difficult times, when you had mentioned here, like Paul had mentioned, mm -hmm. when being, when you're near death or, or a loved one dies and, and, and or something bad happens and then you think that the Lord has forgotten you or is uh, mad at you for some reason. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, look at that verse again. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. So, I mean, we think about everything that we might face in the world. That's, that's, that's some pretty tough stuff that we can face, but nothing not even the power of hell can can separate us and so that's uh, it's supposed to be an affirming message i think right it's supposed to give us the reminder that there is the greater love of god that is supporting us and you know sometimes dragging us along yeah. <laughs> right it, kind of, it goes back to what we were talking about last week where it provides us with comfort and hope mm. and, and strengthens our faith those characteristics that we talked about it's like that uh have you you know the uh, what is it the footprints in the sand have you, you heard that oh, poem yeah. yeah well there's the revised version you know the original is you know there's i look back and there was one set of footprints well the revision says i look back and i ask god i say god there's two sets but what about that section where there's only one um one big line and jesus said that's when i carried, carried you kicking and screaming <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, thank you pastor Pastor, then if the God's love for us is in Jesus Christ is greater than the worst hardship we could ever face. No. So God's love is more reliable than anything that comes against the believer. And nothing and no one in all creation can separate God's family members from God's love. But Pastor, also on that uh, those verses I wanted to go over, uh, that idea about God's love for us is in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? God's love for us in Jesus Christ. But for God so loved the world, right? Um, so that God was willing to send His Son. That's you know, a tenet of our faith. And since God was willing to um, sacrifice in that way, um, we say this proves God's love for us. Right? It's kind of like you know, it goes back because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Because. Because of who he was, because of what he did, but also because of the sacrifice that he was to God, uh, that proves. And it's kind of like a, it's a you know, put your money where your mouth is kind of thing, right? God was saying, you know, this is how much I'm giving you, my son, right? And I'm letting him fulfill all the things that that need to be, um, so that we could experience and understand abundant life, and doing so out of love. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Pastor. So God tells us how great his love is so that we will feel totally secure in him. So if we believe that these overwhelming assurances, we will not be afraid. We will not be afraid in our lives. We have confidence in knowing that the Lord loves us. Nothing will ever be able to separate those of us who are in Christ from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So those who are saved through faith in Christ are saved eternally and forever. That's from John 10, verse 28 to 29. Pastor, we're almost out of time here, so uh, we jump to the conclusion. So the book of Romans is more than a theological explanation of God redeeming grace. It's a letter of comfort and confidence addressed to you, to us. Amen. If we are tempted to look to our circumstances and situations as a measure of God's love, as we have been talking about, then we will struggle to feel assurance if we think in terms of a God 
is uh, angry at us or we're, we're not, not getting what we want. Right. And that affects the relationship that we have with the Lord. So what God offers us and said is to look to the work he has done in Jesus Christ. So the believer's confidence can be found in the generous, steadfast, and overwhelming love of God in Jesus Christ. So God's love for us in Christ Jesus is something that we cannot hide from. Wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we become in life, God still loves us. God's love is made known in the person of Jesus who lived our life, died our death, and rose for our sake. Amen. So we are saved by God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our confidence comes from the knowledge that Jesus suffered hardships for our sake. So when we face hardships or feel a lack of assurance in our faith, we can continue being convinced that we can face them unafraid because of God's love will never leave us. So we are loved by God always, no matter what and forever. And God loves you. God loves us. Amen. Pastor, any closing thoughts? Well, you know, just that this is who we are, right? This is who we are as uh, the people of God. That we understand everything we understand about God uh, begins and ends um, with love. Why would God create us in the first place? Because He loves us. Why would God uh, promise to be with us? Because He loves us. Why would God give us purpose and and give us His Holy Spirit? Give us Jesus. Why would God give us wisdom? Why would God give us the church and all these things? Why would God do these things? because of love and so part of answering our questions in life is, is kind of going back to that when we feel like okay God uh, you're trying to tell me something or you're trying to show me something or I've just experienced your presence in some way um, why did you tell me that why did you reveal that why did you show up well first and foremost out of love and when we receive um, you know, the love of God in that way I think it helps us better understand and appreciate whatever lesson comes out of you know whatever it is or whatever assurance or whatever it is but we understand that it comes from uh, this sense of um, unyielding love that God has for us um, this uh, everlasting love that, that God has or and even that even that, that God has but that who God is that's that's the deeper part it's not just that God has love for us God is love, Scripture tells us, and shares himself with us. Um, so that's, that's who God is. Yeah. And then, again, just to emphasize that the Lord's love, and God's love will never leave us. He promises that he'll always be with us. Mm -hmm. so that's a wonderful and comforting thought that the Jesus Christ and the Lord and the Holy Spirit are always with us no matter what. No matter how bad we behave <laughs> or things that... <laughs> We may do, but he loves us. And, and even, you know, in a practical sense, I used to kind of jokingly, I don't know if I ever put it in a sermon, but I tell people, you know, a lot of people will pray, you know, God be with me this day or be with so-and-so. And, -so. and well, don't waste your breath praying that prayer. God has already promised to be there, right? Um, and then also sometimes, uh, like in church mission, and we do, you know, outreach or we go do, you know, some kind of project. Sometimes people say, well, we brought God to those people. No, you didn't. God was already there with them. Now, maybe they didn't know that, but you didn't bring God. God led you and uh, to help you you and those whoever else realize that he's always been there. Right? There's nowhere that you can bring God that God is not already there. Um, that's pretty, you, pretty awesome. And then for the Seekers class, just remember... God loves each and every one of you. He loves all of us. God Amen. loves us. There's a t-shirt I want to order, brother. It says, uh, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. Great job. Pastor, then, uh, 
unless we have some other discussion, we're close with the prayer. I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, you know, the last thing I'll just say is, again, we talk about the love of God, God all the time because that's our basic understanding of who God is. And it also reminds us of who we are called to be in response. If we say we love God in, in return, it's not just, oh, you know, God, I have warm, fuzzy feelings about you. It's, uh, and you've probably heard me say this before, you know, for God so loved the world that he did something, right? And the same is true for us. We love God. How do we know that? How do we show that? By doing whatever he's asked us to do. Uh, how we for, live our lives. Forgiving enemies, helping those in need, uh, w whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that God's called us to do in, in any given moment. Those are the ways that we express the love of God. Now, we don't earn the love of God. It's the way that we express uh, our love for God. In, 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 those in ways. gratitude. In gratitude, yeah. And, and thankfulness. That's right. Amen to that. Yes, sir. So, Pastor, we'll, we'll close with a prayer. Yes, sir. Please do. Increase my faith, Lord Jesus. Grant me your assurance that nothing will separate the Father's love from me. Nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Seekers. God Amen. loves you. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, brother, for your time. Uh, we'll be back live next weekend, I assume, and uh, we'll, we'll keep on track. So you join in next Sunday at 930. Uh, of course, at 1045, we have worship. Um, I won't be there, but I'll still be preaching. You can't get away from Nothing can separate my preaching from kiss. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, so anyway, thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of the week, and God be with you. Long seekers. <laughs>